Hi everyone, Raphael Harry here, and you're listening to White Label American, a podcast where we hear stories from an immigrant or two, sometimes more. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of White Label American. I'm your host, Raphael Harry. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all our people working on the front lines and um, everyone, healthcare, delivery, uh, uh, people making life easier for us by fighting for our rights, our civil rights, and all over the world. We appreciate each and every one of you. Um, thank you all for the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we are with each and every one of you. We know it's emotionally draining, but we appreciate you for doing what needs to be done. Um, today's guest is a good friend of mine who I didn't realize that we both came to Bahrain at the same time, but the Middle East brought us together. And uh, it was a funny way we became friends, which was like a rivalry in sports, um, soccer to be precise, <laughs> and he will tell you how. But, um, yeah, you know, you, you, you go through life and sometimes you, um, you just have funny experiences and, you know, if you don't know, you just take things like, oh, this guy is not the right person or, you know, you just, this, is the, this event happened and I'm not going to talk to you kind of thing. But sports tend to be fun. And in these times that we tend to look at differences, it is good to remember situations where you met people at um, a time where you were in a situation that brought different people together. And this was a gentleman who I got to meet through a good friend Jeff Schumacher, who I'm pronouncing his name in a Dutch style because in America we say Schumacher. And um, he's, he was also in the Navy with me and he had said, come watch it. Uh, it was Euro 2012. Come watch the games with the Dutch fans. And I'm, I'm never, I've never been um, the uh, Dutch supporter except when the Netherlands is facing England. That's the only time you, you catch me officially supporting the Netherlands, or maybe when the Netherlands is playing against Argentina, but they always disappoint me too that way. But we won't talk about that today. And I saw that as an opportunity to do what I've been dreaming of doing, which was put on my German jersey and show up to an, uh, a venue where there were majority Dutch fans. And I, they were like, what? 20, 30 Dutch people in there, all in orange. And I'm probably like, um, I, I knew I was the only black person wearing German, a German shirt. And I show up in there and boy, it was. <laughs> they turned the heat on me. But the good thing was like, it was that Netherlands lost. And I had a great time talking trash. And at the end of it all, the, the Dutch guys bought me drinks and, you know, we, we had a good time. And through that, you know, today's guest um, became friends. And we've always talked trash on Facebook and, you know, we've always been in touch since then. So without much further ado, um, I introduce Selwyn Kola Rampasad, who was born in Almelo, Almelo Netherlands. and. He has a diverse background, born to a Suriname mom and a Turkish dad. And he has been in tennis coaching for 20 years, which brought him to the Middle East. He arrived there around the same time that I did, in the same year. And he, he stayed there until about three years ago with his family and uh, returned back to the Netherlands. And he's now also into golfing. He's married with two kids, 
And he's an all-round fun person, except when you start supporting, he knows that you're not supporting any of the teams that he doesn't like. Then he might turn into a little, you know, back and forth with him. But in, all in all, he's, he's a fun guy to talk to about um, life and sports, and he's just a cool person. So welcome on the show today, Sewin. How you doing? Thank you for having me, Raf. I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, so happy to have you here. And uh, mm-hmm. let's begin with um, Almelo. So, you know, every time most people hear about Netherlands, everybody's always talking about Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Amsterdam. But we, we really know other cities, and I've been to one or two more, and Geez, I even forgot. Uh, I suppose I was supposed to write this city down, but I'll try and remember it before the end of the of this episode. Um, so Almelo doesn't sound Dutch, in my opinion. It kind of has a Spanish flavor to it. So, can you mm-hmm. introduce us to your to your city of um, your your origins? Well, um, to be honest, I was born there, but I didn't live that long in the city of Almelo. I moved when I was three to Zwolle. Oh. And um, Swole is actually based, it's basically my hometown. Yeah. I wasn't born there, but raised till, what, 22, 23, until I decided to travel a bit. And then, um, so if you want me to tell something about my hometown, it's going to be Zwolle. Zwolle. Yeah, that sounds more, more, yeah, that sounds more like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's close to the German border, though. Aha. Now, you know me and, and Germany, so... Yeah, I know. I was actually <laughs> I was actually tagging you on Facebook to show you the picture with all the Dutch suits we uh, were, were wearing when we met in the in the bar oh, during the Euros. Man, you should I, you should watch your Facebook. You can okay. see what I mean. I pro- I probably do that. I haven't been on Facebook. Uh, I, yeah, well, I was tired after volunteering this morning. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, what can I say? Sola. Um, well, great city to be honest. Very diverse. Um, I think the place in Southern where I, where I lived was, uh, pretty, pretty international. We had a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, international people. I think the school, um, my junior school was basically full of internationals, people from all over the world. Um, b- barely any Dutch people, uh, like, 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 uh, white skinned really? uh, Dutch people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people from uh, well Suriname, uh, the Dutch Antilles, um, Turkey, Morocco. So um, yeah, a lot of it, it was basically uh, in the place where we live, uh, a very international place, uh, an international place. So I gotta ask this question. Tell me. Um, I think it was two, two, three years ago. Yeah. I was in Germany for Christmas and, you know, my, my wife's area is right across the border from Netherlands. And, um, well, it was before Christmas, way before Christmas. It was early December. And we yeah. crossed over for, I think it's, it's St. Nicholas Day. Is it St. Nicholas? Is that a day? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, that yeah, was, that was that, early, early, early December, early right? December, yeah. yeah. So it was the day after St. Nicholas, or yeah, or, yeah, I think it was the day after St. Nicholas, and we went over for some shopping, and boy, that was like the biggest culture shock, one of the biggest culture shocks I've had, because, man, I wasn't expecting to see all that black face everywhere, and I was like, woo! I saw that, and I was like, woo, that was, yep. woo! I, I took some pictures and videos, and I was like, man, this is... It was, I mean, I still got some good deals on clothes that I bought, though. I'm not going to lie. But I still, I was like, man, this, <laughs> this, was, <laughs> this was, it was, the first store I walked into, they, they had like the St. Nicholas um, little doll was just like greeting me out of the, the was like, hi, out of the door. I was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> it was like, yeah. you know, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yep. You know, I've, I've heard the talk about it, but I just never pictured it. And I've had the controversy and all that. So, well, in in, in Zolle, I said it right, right? Zolle? Yeah, yeah. Zolle. Zolle. So, yeah. Did, did this? Um, did they have that same Saint Nicholas thing going it's, on it's, there? It's it's in the whole country, from north to south, from from east to west. The whole country is full of it. 
although the last few years um uh with the whole with the whole how can i say this properly uh it it, it became very um controversial you know and um it's it's a bit it's a bit um sad to see because it's a kids thing so for kids it's really a, a celebration but i think the last three years i think after after you visit our country yeah um it became uh, a little bit difficult so now we're not allowed to to color the face black anymore it has to be all different colors red yellow purple white whatever so um you know it's it's it, it's difficult to talk about it with with, with people um, it, it depends a bit on where you're from and, and and how you think about it i think from a kid's point of view it's just a celebration and i think for um, a lot of people going way back it's a very um um it's a very tricky situation to talk about it because obviously um history showed with all the slavery and everything mm -hmm. it's it's um no it's hard and and when you take it that personal you have to understand that person that it's not a funny thing to see or a funny thing to uh to be confronted about so i think now it's 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 um good it's the way it is um colored skin peat is what we call it yeah, no colored skin peat <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah I, like i said uh back in the days uh when we celebrated it yeah um we still we still celebrate it i mean for the kids especially mm -hmm. having two young kids we celebrate it and um, um it's it's just it's just a way of, of giving them presents and and having this this so-called dutch celebration but it's 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 different i have to say it's different compared to years ago where it was just black peat and um if you don't think about it from um from history point of view then absolutely uh, nothing is a uh, is is wrong you just have a great day with the kids and uh you take it from there well, but like i said yeah uh, it's a two, it's a two way street you know well i, I just found it fascinating cuz i wasn't going into stores like hey you guys got to change this or anything I, I was just like man i was just mind blown like i've never seen that amount of blackface there, there's no way around it. it was just blackface to me in my life that was just like whoa but you, you, I, you I, knew I, it was a dutch celebration I, I i i've heard about it yeah i've seen clips of it but when someone who hasn't seen it or experienced it sees it live in the person I mean, it's a huge shock. It's a, it was a huge shock to me. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. So I, I was like, whoa. And, 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 and I, it wasn't like the whole town was just white-skinned Dutch people. There were dark-skinned Dutch people in that same town. So it, it, it made it like even more mind-blowing to me. But like I said, I still got some good deals for the clothes I bought. I still went shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so I still like, hell, you know, I'm still going to do my thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm still fantastic. I'm, I'm still going like you know. I still document this down and say, hey, this was an experience that I got, and I'm not like just going to bash everybody here. But I'm just documenting this down, and when I meet a Dutch person, I'm still going to ask them. So like you know, my my German in laws were like, yeah, this is how it happens here. So I was like, I found it fascinating because I'm coming from Germany, and like if I talk to a regular American, they're going to be like, oh no, it's, I'm, it's Germany. I'm supposed to be like this. I'm like, no, it's not Germany. This is a Dutch thing. You know, yeah. like if I just show them the pictures and say, "Hey, where, where do you think this happened in? Is it uh, Netherlands or Germany?" Most people say, "Oh, Germany," but, but I'm but like, not only here, huh? It's yeah. in Suriname. It's in the Dutch Antilles. And when you look at the Dutch Antilles, the mm -hmm. ABC Islands, um, where um, you have mainly black-skinned people, yeah, uh, they even still celebrate it. They still even celebrate it. So. So was it something you know, that the Dutch took over there during colonialism? I, I, or, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, Dutch, the, Dutch, the Dutch brought it there. I mean, obviously, these countries are uh, are having the, the language of, 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 of Holland, the, yeah. the Dutch language. They, they teach it at school. So obviously, a, a little bit of Dutch history, mm -hmm. which brings St. Nicholas and his, uh, his uh, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
That's just crazy. But yeah, that that's well I've I've learned something today. So so now if I if I if I'm in one of those islands now, I'm not gonna be like surprised, like way shocked, like the way I was shocked to see it in um in I Holland. Know, I, yeah, I can't pronounce that city. I started with a G. It's a long it's a much longer name than Zoli. It's yeah, it's a real that's like a and I think you were in Enschede. Enschede, I think so. I think so. Because that's that's normally where you cross the border when you're halfway Holland, and then when you go down all the way down, you go to uh, Maastricht. But I don't think you were there. I think it was I, en- I, Enschede. Was uh, yeah, I think it was Enschede because um, yeah, some yeah, yeah, it was en- probably Enschede, small nice town with um, a nice shopping complex. Yeah, um, good shopping Must deals be. too. Yeah, and them them jeans still fit. And I look sexy in the jeans too. So, yeah, I, 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 see, I see the way people stare at me when I'm wearing those jeans. So, Mr. Hey. Playboy, <laughs> don't fault me for being sexy. So, I got to ask the next question: What's your favorite childhood memory? You know, I I, I saw that that question, and um, I was thinking about it. And um, to be honest, I. I don't really have like a favorite childhood, favorite moment. It's, it's, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's no, it's, I can't really think about a favorite moment in my childhood, to be honest. Wow. Um, I, I think looking at it from now, uh-huh. I think one of the favorite childhood moments were, um, having the chance to play the game of tennis, like I told you. Uh, it brings me to who I am today, uh, who I became, um, who I am to my kids, yeah. uh, to my students, um, in a little way to my wife. But uh, no, I That's think- That's interesting. I think, <laughs> well, I mean, when, I, when, I, when I'm teaching tennis or when I'm playing tennis or when I'm playing golf, uh, She's doing the kids, so uh, I'm I'm very lucky. She's looking at me right now with a with a <laughs> straight eye, saying, "What the hell are you talking about?" <laughs> so I have yep. to I have to I have to be aware of the things I say today. <laughs> hey, that says, t- tell her that she can come after me if you get in trouble. If you say something that puts you in trouble, I, I, I'll I'll uh, take responsibility. <laughs> no, no so, problem. No so problem. What what was that first moment like for you when you held the racket and struck a ball? Well, uh this is this is actually a really funny thing to talk about because um we had a tennis club opposite our flat and that club was a little elite thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, not many people were a member there and it was quite funny because the coach was a guy from Suriname as well. And we were always walking around the fence, waiting for people to hit a ball over the fence and we would steal it and then <laughs> run away and then use it for all kinds of games. And then one day we saw a hole in the fence and me and my friends were looking in the hole and the coach left and we were like, oh, we need that bucket of balls because we can go all month doing all these games we were playing outside because we were always losing balls and things like that. And then me with my big mouth, as you know, I said, you know what? I'll take the bucket. No worries. So I jumped in the, I jumped over the fence and I went through the hole, I entered the court. And while I was entering the court, me and my, uh, my friends were just screaming and, and, and running away. And I was like, what's going on? So I was trying to go back to the to the hole and then there was a guy standing over there and then I thought I'll go through the main entrance and then the coach came back and he was he was blocking me so I was like okay and he's like what are you doing here I said well um we saw a hole in the fence we were we we wanted to look he's like how many balls did you take and I was like no nothing sir nothing nothing at all and um so he's like okay so if you if you want to steal balls, show me what you got. So he gave me his racket and he forced me to hit some balls. And I was like, uh, no, why? So apparently he <laughs> knew my mom. And the funny thing was I was playing a little bit because I was like, okay, better this than calling my mom because I would be in big trouble. Yeah. Be better off calling the police than my mom. I mean, come on, <laughs> that's no joke. Yeah. <laughs> 
So um, we played like, well, maybe maybe 20 minutes or so. And then he said, okay, um, you know what? Next week, same time, same place. And I was like, no. He's like, yeah. I was like, why? He's like, well, you come back or I'll tell your mom. I was like, okay. <laughs> so we did this for about three weeks. In the meantime, my friends were like, what the hell is going on? What are you doing? And I was like, well, basically you forced me to play tennis and it's actually good fun. But um, I don't know, as long as it doesn't call my mom, I'm fine with it, you know, um, it's okay. So then after three weeks, he, uh, he gave me this paper and he said, give it to your mom. I spoke to her already and you should become a member of the club. And uh, that was it. Wow. Now that was a beautiful story. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, it start, started yeah. off not in the way that, you know, people <laughs> would have expected, but hey, it had a beautiful um, result, you know, that came out of it. Yeah, yeah, so. no, absolutely. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, in a certain way, I'm very blessed to, to have this connection with the tennis court, um, with the tennis coach, obviously, till this day, I still, uh, I still talk to the guy. Oh nice. And uh, although he's uh, he's getting old, he's near his pension, but um, no, it's it's fantastic. It's it's a great story. <laughs> that, 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 that's a, a beautiful. I think that's the most beautiful memory I've I've uh, I've had one of the most beautiful memories I've heard about because um, he he you know there's this um, reaction of nowadays where people are like oh you know if you if you don't um do the deed you don't do if you don't do the crime you know you you, you don't do the time and yeah. we are so quick to like you know throw the the, the bath water with the baby in it you know throw yeah. it away you know lock them up and that kind of man. but he saw potential and there are so many kids who tend to lose out on stuff like that because People want to just be that disciplinarian, you know. We just want to reach out and discipline. And he could have easily done that and disciplined you, you know, oh, yeah, giving you absolutely. a knock on the head. Don't do that again. Get out. Then people would have said that's not wrong to do, you know. Looking especially for back in those times, you know, it would have yeah. been much easier to just give you a slap. Get out of here, that kind of thing. But by taking that chance in on you, look what it led to. He unleashed the passion in you for a sport that you, because all those times that you guys have been spending trying to grab balls, to <laughs> tennis balls to, you know, I, I didn't mean, mean the pun. That way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, you guys have been spending so much time watching the game yep. with the intention of stealing the ball and running away with it. But well, the fun, you've been the watching. Was yeah. No, the ahead. funny thing was we, we were we were living in a 12-story flat like mm -hmm. a huge flat and then from i think the fourth or fifth floor and higher you could see the courts and you could see people play and we were we were always looking there like what's going on and who are those people and um how do they play and apparently that club which i didn't know at the time was uh one of the best clubs uh in that area wow. in that region so um, again, in a certain way, that that made it more easy for me to to really play. The, sorry, to really play the game of tennis at a pretty good level. Mm -hmm. And um, but but now, it, yeah, like you said, it it could have been easy to punish me and send me away and say uh, move, never yeah. come back. Yeah, never come. That kind Absolutely. of thing, you know. That that that's like the easiest choice or option to take, and just you know, get out of here, kids knuckleheads that kind of thing and you know and well yeah, maybe so, if i was on the other side of the fence that might happen the, the, maybe but by jumping over the fence you know i'm like what's wrong with that kid that, that rascal <laughs> but hey you, you took the you you made the right move <laughs> so if you're listening sometimes you gotta jump over the fence to go grab the bucket <laughs> yep. Yep. Just, just know what fence you're jumping over. If there are dogs there, don't, don't say I told you to do that. <laughs> you, you, might, you might get a free tennis lesson or three. <laughs> you, you might. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, you grew up in uh, a fascinating household yep. with parents from two different cultures. Yeah. And was that a common thing? 
in your because you already alluded to um, families. Uh, you grew up in a multi-ethnic community. Yeah. So, what was it common for people of different ethnicities to get married? Well, uh, at that time, maybe not not as not as much as as now. Mm-hmm. I think when you look at the different nationalities in in our country, it's it's a lot. It's huge. Um, it's yeah. common. It's yeah. It's it's daily life. I mean, um, when you compare it to countries like China, where people expect you to marry someone else from China or a lot of other Asian people. Well, even, even here uh, in, in the United States, if you look at the data, it's yeah, ethnicities don't really mix. It's it's still we don't really mix that much. You know, we still really yeah. If you look at the data, we. We still don't like interracial relationships. It's still not a, a large. It's not it, the 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 movies might portray or celebrities might portray a different picture. But if you yeah. look at the data, we're still not that. We're not you know compared to. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's not that different from many places. It, we, we're not. Yeah, it's it's a large. It's not a large number of people that cross over into another ethnicity to. No, I th- I think here it is. I, I can't say how much uh, percentage wise, but mm-hmm. um, no, I th- I think you have a lot of mixed races uh, uh, being together in a relationship here. So, but so, so back during your parents' days, it wasn't was. Do you know if it was a common thing? Not sure. Not sure. I I I think it was. Um, although from my father's side. He was expecting to uh, expected to marry a Turkish woman, and the way they met was actually even more funny because my mom had an arranged marriage when she was, uh, I think, nineteen or so, mm. and then uh, basically forced by her dad. Yeah, um, she showed up, and then basically left him at the spot. Wow, <laughs> which 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 was which was a a very disgraced thing to do to the family, um, both sides, but definitely uh-huh. my, our our side. Um, but um, I I think in in the process of leaving the house, um, she met my dad, and then they were together for a couple of years, and then um, things didn't work out between them, mm. and uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of years later, he died pretty young. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was basically born with my sisters and my mom. Yeah, I had to ask, and i um, sorry to hear about your, your um, dad passing away. Because um, it's always fascinating to me when I hear about people from communities um, such as your dads and moms, because I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with... Um, people from those communities and it, it's not uncommon to hear of arranged marriages in, in those societies and the, the strict adherence to, you know, parents' expectations like, oh, you know, you must marry from here or we found a husband for you or we found a wife and, you know, and sometimes there's, uh, it even leads to fatalities for the person who does not abide by that arranged marriage. So uh, for the fact that your mom was even able to marry your dad it's a testament to her resilience and yeah. she 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 got to control her own story and tell her own story and leave well, it on I her th- own I th- terms so uh, yeah i think i think that was her luck because uh, like i said maybe maybe that was the thing of being here in holland mm-hmm. um i think because it was more common here um he wasn't able to control or force it um just a minute I think I think now with um, having having these um, mixed races uh, mixed races here, it was easy for her to leave uh, without any any problems. Mm-hmm. I, I think from from my um, grandfather's side because he was born and raised in India, yeah. And you know how the culture is there. I mean, the Hindis are quite strict and can be very tough, especially when it comes down to those arrangements. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I think her luck was to be here in Holland. And then um, I think her brothers, because she had five little brothers, they were on her side. They'd want, they didn't, they didn't want to have 
uh, arranged marriages as well. Oh, okay. So I think that that's the luck. I see. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's, it's always um, good to hear such stories and um, hopefully inspire people out there who haven't gotten to that stage yet of uh, freedom where they can easily move on to uh, make their own decisions. As, uh, well, as we've both been in the Middle East. You know how things are going there sometimes. I yeah. Mean, um, yeah, it's uh, like you said. It depends on where you are, mm -hmm. and I think that's the good thing here in Holland. Um, like I said, it's quite common to mix here. I, from our side, I mean, maybe it's because we're um, having a different background. I don't know. For us, I mean, looking at my wife, she's from Indonesia and Holland, so mix there, yeah, mix here. Wow, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna keep mixing. <laughs> It's like a nice sweet cocktail. Hey, there you go. The more the merrier. Yep. <laughs> no problems here. So um, let's jump forward a little bit. And uh, we've talked about how you got into tennis. And um, well, before we, we jump forward all the way. So you, you got into tennis, started... Um, you know, you joined the club, but did you have uh, a, a, who 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 was your your inspiration or your tennis player, your go to tennis player back when you started? When I started, I basically had two tennis players. Obviously, a Dutch guy, Richard Krajcek. Mm. Um, um, I think he was at the time um, our country's number one. But my biggest example back then um, was Pete Sampras. Oh, Pete Sampras, yeah. Pete Sampras, born on the same day as as myself, twelfth ah. of August, <laughs> which which I did which I didn't even know at the time. But um, no, I think uh, um, at that time he was very very athletic, very um, keen, very lean, very. I mean, it was everything he did was fine. Everything he did was smooth, and um, yeah, that was it. I I wanted to watch every match. Mm. Tried to do all the things he did. Yeah, I remember Pete Sampras with his hair. And yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I was yeah, I was, I was the fascinated. Good, the, good <laughs> the good rivalry between Sampras and Agassi. And Agassi, that was all yeah. Fun. <laughs> Absolutely, Ag Ag Agassi was more of the rock star for me, so I, I think I used to lean towards Agassi for a little. No, bit. that's only because you both have bald. I never knew I was going to be bald. I had, I had an afro back then, you know, so <laughs> like, that wasn't even close. I, ju I just liked Agassi. <laughs> I think it was more of his wife that I liked him for. Um, was the tennis player he used to? He was married to back then. I don't know if he's still uh, married he, to her. Well, he he was married with Brooke Shields. Yeah, it was with Brad. Yeah, but he always seemed to and be then, able to catch them start. and now 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 he's with the Dutch which with the German lady Steffi Graf yeah Steffi Graf yeah I was a fan of Steffi Graf I was more into the ladies tennis before I, I jumped over to, to the men's to be honest <laughs> yeah. yeah right for which reasons good reasons yeah true <laughs> hey I'm honest so you, you got me there <laughs> so um now let's jump forward you decided, you know, you you went into tennis, then became someone who decided to impact the knowledge of tennis onto others, and then made a move to come to a, a different part of the world. So how did you end up in the Middle Eastern Kingdom of Bahrain? Well... I mean, I was I was coaching for about maybe ten years here in the Netherlands, and then um, uh, I used to play international level uh, when I was young. So we travel the world, we see places, and then obviously um, in our country, a lot of things are outdoors, mm -hmm. and the clubs I was teaching was uh, outdoors only. So it was great in the summer, but in the winter, especially after ten years. You're like, hmm, the winters are tough. You're you're standing there with a 
with two sweaters, a big jacket, your cap, your hat, your, your will, everything. And then two of my best friends were working abroad. One was working in Miami, Miami, Florida. Yeah. And uh, every time when we were messaging each other or sending pictures to each other, you see him in, in, a, in, a, in a short and shirt, <laughs> palm trees, beaches, <laughs> all these things. And I'm just sending him snow or rain or grumpy face or all these things. <laughs> and then another friend of mine, um, he, uh, he worked for a company in Dubai. And um, I was asking, like, how did you end up uh, there and what's going on and what's the procedure? I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in teaching. I mean, I love, I love being a tennis coach. I love teaching kids and adults and everything. But the weather in Holland was terrible. I mean, I don't mind a, a tough winter, but when the summers are crap and you have rain in the summer and you don't really have sun anymore, mm -hmm. then I'm becoming a grumpy face. So he said um, in 2011 that he was leaving and if I was interested in taking his spot. So I said, well, uh, yeah, I mean, what's the procedure? What's going on? So I got into this interview with his boss and then um, uh, I was supposed to start in Dubai, which I did. And after two months, the company uh, opened a location in Bahrain. And I mean, you, you've, been, you've been in Dubai, right? No. No? I was supposed to go and then the Navy were like, ah, uh, you can't travel then. Somebody okay. misbehaved. So, you know, when someone misbehaves, then, then they, they ban all of us from going there. Yeah, no. The thing is, I mean, Dubai is a nice place. Very flashy, very mm -hmm. this, very that. All the rich people together, blah, blah, blah. But for a tennis coach, I mean, we're just a tennis coach. We're not an expat. Um, we don't make tons of money. We're just doing our job in a very nice place. And after two months, I was like, hmm, is this it? Is this it? And then he said, um, would you like to come with me um, to Bahrain? And I was like, what's, what's going on in Bahrain? To be honest, I didn't even knew about Bahrain yeah. until, he un until he talked about it. And then he was like, well, it's basically Dubai as in Middle East, but uh, it's more like a village. And I was actually quite interested in that because... Um, I was teaching, I mean, Zwolle is, is a pretty big city, but I was always coaching in the, the small villages around Zwolle, and I loved it there. I mean, everybody knows everybody. Um, uh, it's more familiar. It's, it's, it's very um, easygoing. And so I thought, you know what, I'll give it a go. And I stayed there for years and years and years. <laughs> That's how it goes. Yep. That's how we got to meet. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so no, basically, um, I worked for that company for a year and then um, I was supposed to leave that company. Wasn't really um, happy to stay at the company, but at, it, at the same time, I was actually feeling very fine and very great in uh, Bahrain. And then um, I got the chance to, to start my own business there. And, uh, well, that year I was also getting married. So we had to make a big decision. And, um, yeah, we, we gave it a go. And that was that. Nice. So um, you arrived in Bahrain after a little bit in Dubai. What was the first culture shock that hit you you know like you already said you never knew Bahrain even existed you know and you know like even myself I, I was aware of Bahrain only um thanks to some World Cup qualifiers but I never really knew Bahrain Bahrain itself you know until I arrived yeah. there so I couldn't really say I, I knew I was aware of Bahrain like I, I didn't even realize how small it was until you, you get there. It's, it's like, you know, yeah. I, I remember telling my mom, I'm going to Bahrain. And like, yeah, yeah. And then she looked like, where, where is he? I can't even find it on the map. I'm like, that, that's the point. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> you got you to gotta look really. <laughs> you got to get a yep. fine lens. So they look, look into the map. Yep. <laughs> then, yep. Expand the map. Then you see it. 
So well, it's 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 difficult to uh, to uh, explain Bahrain to uh, a lot of people who don't know Bahrain because mm -hmm. um, when you say Middle East, it's fine. When you say Dubai, oh nice. Mm -hmm. But when you tell them it's a neighbor of Saudi Arabia, you get people saying, "Oh, really?" Yeah. And um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's uh, it's difficult because. Um, as you know, Bahrain is a wonderful place. I mean, to be honest, the people there are so fantastic. They're lovely. Uh, the locals, I mean, compared oh, yeah. to Dubai, compared to Dubai, I think in Dubai, I, I didn't even meet locals um, at all. I was mainly working with expats. I've heard and, that. Um, you, you're not the first person I've heard that from. <laughs> so th I think that was that was the ideal way of living there. I mean, you, you meet the locals. Um, um, obviously in my work field, um, working with the national teams there, um, you really, you really get a chance to know the country, not only the tourist places, but also the, 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 the local places and they take you there. I mean, when they, when they invite you at their house, I mean, mm. it's, it's fantastic. But when you talk about culture shock in the middle East, I think the, the craziest thing there was the driving. <laughs> the, I mean, I mean, we can do some crazy things here, um, but the driving there, oh my God. I mean, obviously you have uh, the people from Saudi coming over during the weekends. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you have, you have a four lane highway, Ooh. Oh man, a, a four way, uh, four, four way lane highway going into six seven lanes without the lines and you're like what the hell is going on i mean they take over from the left they take over from the right it's 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 unbelievable that was the biggest thing i mean other than that um I, no culture i mean uh, it's a muslim uh, country and um half my family are muslims mm -hmm. um so to me that wasn't a big um surprise at all but the the driving yeah oh the driving my goodness is... that was <laughs> I, I, I think the, we started with we, when I worked for the company, we started with uh, rental cars and the first 12 months I ended up at 12 accidents because people were hitting me from behind and I was actually a safe driver. But then I thought, <laughs> you know what, I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to drive safe. Yeah. And then, and then they are hitting me from behind. They tried to blame you. Mm hmm. I mean, yeah. especially the people from Saudi, they try to blame oh, yeah. you. Oh, yeah. And then I thought, you know what? Before you know, you you turn into a lunatic as well. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm going left, right, because that's what they do. You've adapted, man. <laughs> You've adapted <laughs> or else you keep getting into accidents. <laughs> I, I, I was fortunate enough to have driven in some crazier places, so... As soon as I, I figured out how the, the driving was, it, it wasn't, yeah, I, I felt at home. So people were like, huh? You've been here before? Are you used to, you, you drive like a Bahraini? I was like, like no, 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 no. It, there are certain places where if, if you've driven there, you, you, you understand how to drive here. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, that was, that was the craziest thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, um, obviously, we were there in 2011 when the political things came a little bit in. Oh, the Arab Spring. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That was there. So yeah. um, I, was, I was a bit surprised that um, knowing in Dubai and in Qatar, the locals get a lot of uh, uh, government um, help mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in financial ways. But you saw locals um, living in... Um, houses that had cracks and things like that and you're like wow even here which which is so-called a rich place where um, everybody um, is basically draining oil so people shouldn't have these these old cracked houses and mm -hmm. i mean you're, you're talking about families with good jobs i mean they work for the government and they 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 work in the military, which is basically a huge thing in Bahrain. Uh, and then they, they invite you and you're happy. I mean, again, um, great welcome. But you are a bit surprised uh, about these things. So, um, no, those are the two things I, that was, well, obviously the driving number one. But um, no, the other thing as well. Yeah. 
That is, it's good that you noticed that because uh, you, you, you were able to understand or have an idea of why people were protesting. I, I was able to meet, I met protesters. Uh, I wasn't one of those servicemen who went and signed petitions and uh, took sides in the protest, but I was able to understand where the protesters were coming from. And yeah, and like uh, even the footballers who got locked up in the protest, you know, um, what, yeah. was it, what was it that place called? The Pell, uh, the former Freedom Square that, they, they, that got bulldozed. It was still standing uh, you there. Mean, you mean the, the Pearl Harbor, uh, the Pearl, uh, the Pearl Roundabout? Yeah, the Pearl Roundabout. Yeah, yeah. You know, at the beginning of Arab Spring, that roundabout yeah. that they took down, which was sad. I was like, well, you didn't have to do that, but uh, yeah. Well, really. I've, I've 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 never seen the Pearl, but uh, the funny thing was when I when I came to Bahrain, they they filled these uh, three apartment flats at the Pearl Roundabout, and I was living there. In one of those uh, oh, apartments. Were, no, that's where you were living. So we 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 had we had security <laughs> top notch, security top notch. Oh man, yeah, I remember, I remember those. Um, yeah, I remember, I remember the roundabout. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was, it was it was it was crazy. I'm not, yeah, I, I got stories upon stories from Bahrain, man. But, no, I, I, but I, it was a great. Yeah, I, I love the people there, though. I love them. I got to talk to the Sunnis and the Shias, and I had everybody out, though. So it was a great learning experience for me, also. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, what what do you miss the most about Bahrain since you left? Food. The food. The fo the food. Oh my God, the, the local <laughs> food. I mean. Even here, I mean, even here you have um, Turkish, Lebanese, yeah. um, um, but um, it's just different, you know. Mm -hmm. Go, going there in, in, into these small local less yeah. restaurants, when when you look from outside, you say, you think, oh, I will never ever put one foot in that shop, and then the locals are like, no, come, we're gonna eat. The food is fantastic. And I mean, I, my, I always, I always had shawarma on the streets, man. The the street side shawamas. Yeah. yeah since <laughs> since I left Bahrain, shawarma has not tasted the same to me, man. It has. Well, you were you were close to shawarma alley there, right? Nah, shawarma alley is not even um, that that doesn't even count to me, man. I I would go into the the city like even at the souk. I, if I yeah. saw one of these street vendors, I would, that's why. Yeah. I, I remember the first time I bought shawarma. From a vendor, I went to. I was going to see my tailor in the souk because my tailor was in, in, at the souk, and I was by myself, and I saw this guy, and the shawarma just looked juicy. I was like, "Man, what you got there?" And he didn't even understand English that much, but we yeah. we, 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 we figured it out. We figured it out. It was <laughs> lamb and uh, lamb and goat. I think he had. And yeah. He, I was like, I, I just, I just need boat. So he gave me boat, and I gave him like five BD. And um, I got juice. Um, yeah, I think I got orange juice or so, or pineapple, whichever one he had. Yeah. And I, I got it, and I was I had five oh. BD, and this was huge. And I was like, yeah, this this should cover everything. So I gave him five yeah. BD, and I started walking away. And I started hearing somebody, boss, 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 boss. I'm like, it can't be me, man. Nobody knows me here. Yeah? Boss, 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 boss. So I said, like, let me just turn around. And I turn around. And I see this guy had been chasing me for like three, four minutes. Like, boss, what's your change? Your change? <laughs> I was like, man, <laughs> this poor guy chased me all the way. Like, how much? He? The change was like almost three BD and some cents. And I was like, whoa, how, how much was this stuff? Like, man, you know what? I gave him like two BD. Like, take. He was so happy. And I gave him all the coins too. <laughs> he was so happy. No, the food the food was cheap oh, there. Man, yes. food was cheap. But no, the gas food, was cheap. The oh yep. man, I was like, yeah, man. I, uh, well, every time I got a rental, I fill it up until I realized that man, filling up the rental wasn't good. I had to drive all the time and use use all the <laughs> use all the. Or else <laughs> <laughs> I was returning back too much gas in the car. <laughs> um, I, but I think we we we, uh, we were. We got very spoiled there. Oh yes. I mean, oh yes. You, you guys. I mean, you got you're going to the mall and 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 you're doing your shopping and you have these guys putting the shoppings uh, in, in in the bags and mm -hmm. like you said, you, even when you when you go to the 
to the fuel station and you they do the gas for you yeah. to sit in the oh, car. Th yeah, that, that the first time we, we drove the car into the fuel station, same thing happened. You know, I was out in New Jersey. It's a state law that people do they do that for you in New Jersey. But oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. But I I wasn't used not 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 that state that does that, so I wasn't used to that happening to me. And by then I didn't move to New York, so you know, I wasn't used to something like that happening. So now we're driving to the uh, the gas station, or we call it gas station in America. So the fuel station, and you know I'm about to come out of the car, and the guy runs up. He's like, "Boss, uh, how much?" I said, "What? Yeah. How much?" I said, "What? Why are you asking me how much? Who are you?" <laughs> He's like, "How how much? How much? How much?" I said, "Uh." Well, 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 uh, I, oh. I, I don't know if I know you. Though. Why, why am I going to tell you how much I want to buy? He's like, how much? He's now pointing to the tank. Uh, so I look around and I see that he's he runs to the next car on the other side and then oh, starts loading that car up. So I'm like, oh, uh, I guess this is how it works here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, my friend is there like, yeah, yeah. T t well, I guess. Fill it up. So he, he, the guy open, pops open the tank and starts filling it up. And I'm like, oh. Okay, so I must have looked a little bit mean by not answering him <laughs> the first three times. <laughs> I didn't know that is how it works. Yeah, <laughs> nobody told me. So and then he and I only had credit cards. So I was like, oh man, this is, I feel bad now. So I was like, let me see how much um, BD I got. So I gave him like some. I think I had like ten BD. So I didn't even know how much the fuel yeah. cost. So yeah, I gave him like ten BD, and. We started driving off. This guy chased us again too. Like a oh, bus, bus, bus. I was like, "Is he waving at me or what?" And the bus, bus. So we stopped, and he was bringing change. I was like, "Uh, how, how much is this?" And it was like up to three BD. And I was like, "Boy, you filled up the tank." And it was like a Toyota. Yeah, I think it was like a Toyota uh, Camry. This was in 2011 that we rented, and yeah. we we filled up the tank. And he was like, "Yeah, it was like three BD." I was like, "Whoa." Oh, three BD and this was like three BD was like what fifteen dollars then? And I was like, man, this guy, you know what? Come come back here, man. Take take three BD too. <laughs> take three BD tip. He's like dancing, like yes. My, my, no, but my, I mean for them, three uh, BD is huge. Yeah, my it's boy, my huge. boy was like, well, did, did we just give him his paycheck as a tip? Or I was like, I don't know, but if that's his tip, but if that's that must be really I don't know how much they pay him, but that's a lot of, he's standing in the sun, but anyway, take it, man, that's good. So every time we drove in, like, man, we always give good tips, and man, they, they'll be happy, like, oh, but I was, I was like, man, I, I, I just felt good giving them tips, man. Like, even even when I got my first haircut in a Barini barbershop, it was, oh, this, yeah, yeah that, that, I, my, 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 my stupid supervisor, he didn't tell me, he didn't prepare me, and I, I don't know if I was asleep, so I didn't even watch anybody getting a hair, um, being, Getting a haircut, so I didn't even realize the massage thing was happening and yeah. all the treatments. So I just woke up and jumped into the seat. And as soon as the guy was done, he lifts my arm up. I'm like, "What? What's going on here?" Yeah. And he's like, crack, 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 cracking my arm. I'm like, "Hey, uh, oh, okay, this feels nice, though." And cracks my <laughs> head and hot towel. And I'm like, "Oh, nobody has treated me like this for a haircut. For why? Why has nobody done this to me in my life?" Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, why? I'm, this is so nice. Ah, no, ah. And I, I, then I start looking through the mirror like, is it, do they do this to other people? Am I the only person getting this treatment? But you know what? I don't care. This feels so good. Do yeah, it to me. Keep fantastic. doing it to me all the time because Americans will be acting like if a man is massaging you, hell no, don't touch me. I want a man touching my body. No. Man, yeah. that felt nice. I loved it. <laughs> I wanted another man. I was like, dude, you know what? How much is this haircut? He's like, uh, you pay me whatever you pay, boss. I was like, what do you mean oh, whatever yeah. I oh, pay? Yeah. What the hell you mean whatever I pay? He said, whatever you pay, boss. I said, whatever I pay. I have five BD. He said, whatever you pay, boss. You want change? I was confused. You want, I, like, yeah. I feel bad now. Like, I'm, I'm much, I feel good. You just massaged the hell out of me. My soul came out of my body and came back in. Man, you know what? I don't think five BD is even enough. Take 10 BD. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because because the 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 the, no, the normal fee they 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 take it's it's ridiculous. I yeah. mean, I see people they give like only one or two or three dinars, and you're yeah. like, really? But I did this every week, like every Thursday or uh, Wednesday or Thursday. I I called the guy from the barbershop. I said, Hey, do you have time? 
because mm-hmm. you have a couple of guys they they try to crack your neck and everything but a couple of them you don't really like when they're doing it so i was always going to this one guy and i was like listen when i come here i need i need you not oh, your yeah. friend, I, I, not your I colleague only one you. guy yeah i had my one guy too <laughs> i had my one guy i mean i had a friend who could cut hair real good on base but the first time he cut my hair i was like he's like bro i'm done i'm like uh huh it's like i'm done yeah I'm like, uh, you don't massage. You say, hell no. Nah. I said, man, you're an American. I don't, I don't want to. This is why I don't do Americans, man. <laughs> I think that that's why after I moved back to the United States, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start cutting my hair myself because I, I miss that treatment, man. Getting hot towel on my neck, the yeah. massaging. Oh, my, man, the cracking all the bones. You, you feel brand yeah. new after a haircut. Man, now I'm missing Bahrain all over again. Yeah, I'm, true. Man, that, that I'm was getting hung. I was, was getting good, hungry. Good treatment right there. Good, lovely treatment. I miss that. That's... They they don't have it. They don't have it at all in in the states. Uh, well, unless you pay two hundred dollars. Well, probably I'll have to pay that amount of money. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's why I went bald real quick. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's not it's not gonna take long before I get the bald spots as well. Uh, so. You you get in there too. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you should yep. join us. It's the sexiest club. <laughs> yep. Ah, uh, man. <laughs> good times. Uh, man. I, yeah, I really love I love time. the island though. I mean, yeah, that, that, that was great people. Um, so, um, another fun question to ask. Um, you've been to a few places, you know, around the world. St- spent a lot of time in Bahrain and the Middle East. When it comes to music, where does your heart belong to? Soul, R&B. Mm. Who, 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 uh, who are your favorites? Uh, I listen to basically everything. I mean, um, uh, when you talk about soul, you're talking about Luther, mm. Bandros. Yeah, he went real old school. Yep, yep. And um, no, I I think I think back in the days, um, well, we were young doing crazy things. You had genuine Mario Winans, uh, P Diddy in his in his first couple of years. I, I know P oh. Diddy counts as soul, man. That uh, I know. no 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 uh, no. I said okay. R and B as well. R and B R and B. I don't know P Diddy. Will, P Diddy will be pleased with you call, call, adding his name to R and B. He he might. He might throw a bottle of Ciroc at you, like, how <laughs> dare you? How dare you drink Ciroc? For, for, for us, for us, it was R and B. I mean, R and B. These days they call it urban, but um, even here, um, I, I, th- I think it's a political topic these days not to say urban anymore. But urban music, that's my music. I've, I've never. I don't think I've heard anybody use that terminology, urban music, but. Um... Yeah, I'm... that's what we. That's what they say here in Holland. Really? Yep. Oh, that's a, that's a new one for me. So, I I think one of the labels in in the states is Motown, right? Yep. Uh, so the Motown, Mo- yeah, that was classic. Mo- Motown. Did, did you guys Studios. watch? Did you watch uh, Motown on Saturdays? Did they show Motown over there? The dance. No, room? me and me and my friends were always watching comedy shows. Wow, oh. and you didn't comedy. turn out to be a comedian. <laughs> ain't, ain't no, no I leave the jokes. I leave the jokes at you. I leave the jokes <laughs> for you. So yeah, that reminds me. I don't think do I know any Dutch musician? Hmm. If I wanted to get into Dutch music, who who would you recommend that I start with? Well, these days, I I think uh, these days the biggest things here are uh, the, the so called Dutch rappers. I mean, um, but they 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 rap in Dutch, and it's a huge thing here. I mean, I think the last five five six years, it's all, oh, it's all. Um, you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, these days, it's all uh, yeah Dutch rap, but um, I, I listen to everything. Uh, to be honest, I mean, if it it depends a bit on the mood. Uh, looking at a, a good a good Dutch singer Natasha a good Dutch singer 
singer, international. rapper. Yeah, hit, hit me one rapper, or two. Rapper, singer. That I can I can start off with, walk my way into the Dutch industry. Because I can't ask my uncle who lives in, uh, where, where does he live? Uh, Rotterdam or Feyenoord. He lives around that area. He's been there for the best, ages. the best area, the best area in Holland, yeah. the best area. Tell me why Holland. again. <laughs> Feyenoord. Feyenoord. <laughs> I don't know. No, um, none to be honest. I, I think, I think these days are very well. She, she, she joined the show in, uh, in the States. Why? Uh, I think it was The Voice or um, X Factor. And there was this Dutch lady singer, uh, Glennis Grace. She was famous for her Whitney Houston uh, songs. Mm. You should watch Glennis Grace. Glennis Grace. Yeah. A great voice. Great voice. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, rappers. I mean, unless... Yeah, well, how's your Dutch? Your Dutch is good, right? Well... Uh... I, I leave that to the gods to decide. <laughs> um, well, you have a uh, boof, which is which is basically um, crook. You 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 guys will say crook. We say boof, b o e f, b o e f, which is yeah, which is basically translated to crook. Oh, all right. I'll, I'll I'll have to look that one, that one up. And uh, yeah, those two are are great singers. I mean, I don't think you have a lot of Dutch um, international singers. I mean, we have the Dutch DJs. You know that they yeah, rule the world. I'm pretty sure I've, I've I've listened to a Dutch DJ on. Uh, dang, what's this program called on YouTube? Ah. Uh, I've, I don't know, but you have you have Chesto and you have Armin van Buren, which are the the most famous DJs in the world. Chesto, I mean, that's what, I think when it comes to what what do you Chesto? call it? Chesto, I don't think Chesto. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think I, how you spell that name. T I E S T O. I've never heard of that name before. First time hearing that. Well. Just, Don't just, cancel me just anybody. Just look on the internet. Don't cancel me anybody. I've never heard that, but uh, yeah, I've I've heard of lots of DJs. I got DJ friends, but yeah, it's uh, not my fault. There are too many musicians in my in this brain, oh. so probably Testo knows me. So who's your, I know Testo. Who's 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 your favorite then? Um, I'm not the one. I'm not the guest. People don't want to hear my opinion right now. But I have my one year <laughs> episode coming up, and then you can ask me that question for my one year episode. And then I'll answer that. Yeah, uh, I'll add that to my one year episode. Who's my favorite DJ? And then I'll, we'll do. I'll look into that. We'll do. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, yeah. So now you're into golf. How did that come about? Well, that basically started in Bahrain. I, uh, after a year, um, starting my own business, I had to hire other coaches to basically help me out because I wasn't able to do it alone anymore. And um, one of the guys, he was basically playing short game golf here, and um, I really wanted to. I really wanted to introduce him to Bahrain, and um, he told me, "Listen, I'm a I'm a short game golfer. I'm looking for this golf course. Would you like to join me?" And at first I thought, oh, no, not really. I wasn't really interested. I, I did a clinic two years before that and wasn't really my thing. Um, didn't have the patience. Um, thought it was an old man's game. Just like And me. then, yep. So he, he taught me some tricks. And I think within a couple of weeks, I was basically locked, addicted. And a member. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's to be honest. I, I was at that time. I was injured um, with my left shoulder, and I'm a lefty, so I wasn't mm. able to play um, uh, competitive uh, tennis anymore. 
And with, with golf, I didn't feel uh, the pain. I didn't feel the shoulder. And I was able to basically start a new sport from the bottom to, well, basically the top uh, amateur level. Yeah. So, no, I think after, after playing, what, now 30 years of tennis myself, and then now six, six, I think six years of golf, it was just a new passion. I mean, again, I love the, the teaching part of tennis. I'm not keen on playing tennis myself in, in, in competitive uh, level anymore. I mean, we play the league with a bunch of friends, but that's it. And um, no, but golf, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm locked and loaded. Uh, just want to play golf every day. So when you say short game golfer, what does that mean? So basically you have this game called pitch and putt, which is a, an English game for short game golf. So your distance is um, up to 100 yards, but normally between, let's say, 40, 50 and 100 yards. Mm -hmm. So you have nine or 18 holes. And well, we call it short game golf here. We call it pitch and putt uh, golf. And he was a, a top 10 guy here in, in my country. And um, he wanted to do the, the big game there in Bahrain. So um, they had a short um, golf course there as well. Um, so that's why he wanted to join. And then I joined him. And then uh, before I knew I was playing, I was even in the, in, in the, in the committee, the golf committee within a year. Wow. Because I, was helping, I was helping them out with... Uh, with the tournaments and the competition, the one day competitions they have every, every Friday or Saturday. Yeah. So, um, no, it was, it was fun. And, um, I was, I'm always interested in sports and yeah, when you're good at a certain thing, it's always more interesting. Yeah. It's cool. So yeah, golf, still playing golf and hopefully tomorrow, this time I'm the new club champion. Yeah, Inshallah. I, I, I think you will. I think you will. You will win. You you have that drive that once you get started, it's like you just, you can't stop. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the thing. I mean, once once I go for something, it's 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 all out. I mean, no no way back. Uh, you go for it. And otherwise, there's, there's no, it doesn't make sense to spend all that time and effort for nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's how I've been raised. I mean, you either do something good or you do that you don't do it at all so as i begin to wrap up you gotta ask this question yep you're a tennis you, you're a tennis coach you're a golfer big time football well let me go my german way football fan yep. and out of all this where does your favorite sporting memory come from 2007 Wimbledon final. Rafael Nadal against Roger Federer. I I was blessed to see that match live, and um, I think that was that was the the time where Roger Federer escaped. You were talking about um, my favorite tennis player back in the days, which was Sampras, but then a young, newer version of Sampras rise up, which was Roger Federer. Um, and I think when you, when you talk about um, iconic sports moments, I think that was for me uh, the most iconic sport moment because I was able to see it live. And um, I think another, another, iconic moment for me was um, my hometown uh, Swolle, who also plays in the Dutch Eredivisie, was playing the uh, League Cup final against Ajax a couple of years uh, ago. And I was actually stuck in Dubai and I wasn't able to, to go to that, uh, to go and watch that match. And all my friends are Ajax supporters. So, um, <laughs> I, th I think within four minutes, Ajax scored like a huge free kick, 30 yards out, straight in the top bottom, um, in the top goal. And then we were like, you know what? This is done. Let's go to the mall. Let's eat. And then within, I think, 
20 minutes, I got all these WhatsApp messages from friends. Oh, you're missing something. It's one all. Your hometown is, is leading 2-1. It's 3-1. It's 4-1. And I was like, yeah, funny. You're just joking, uh, whatever. And I didn't have the, um, the internet to, to watch the, the score yeah. and the live score. And then I was able to call a friend of mine. I said, what's going on? He's like, well, I don't know what's going on, but your, your, your club is leading 4-1. And we kick their <laughs> we kick their asses for oh I'm not sure if I'm yeah you're good that, you're good but, you, you, you know you, uh, it's so hard we were so. kicking we were kicking their asses five one, and then the following year, um, um, Swallow was um, into the league final again. So I was texting and messaging my friends and say, listen, um, I'm thinking about coming because it, it was a huge thing. I used to play at that club when I was young as well, so. Um, for me, it was, a, it was a huge thing to go back for that league final. I mean, it's a three-hour bus trip, nonstop boozing, going nuts on the bus. And then um, the, the, the club board member who used to be um, um, a friend of mine when I was playing football myself, he said, we think it's so funny that you come all the way from Bahrain to see this match. We'll give you tickets. So they basically paid my tickets, everything to wow. come to to come and watch the match. We lost, we lost two two nil. <laughs> I was so so wasted that evening. <laughs> didn't even didn't even remember the match at all. <laughs> and um, I, 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 yeah, two, uh, I think two days later, I traveled back to Bahrain. And then obviously, after what eighteen years. Three years ago, when Feyenoord won the league, I uh, I had to travel back. I had to. <laughs> I, yep. was, I was waiting for that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know what the funny thing was? Uh. They were they were playing the the, well, not their rivals, but I mean the young. We we say it's their young brothers, Excelsior, and um, they were playing um, away, but that was in Rotterdam as well. So the the center of Rotterdam was packed, crazy, full, everything. And I said to my wife, I'm, I'm leaving Friday. The match is on Sunday. I take the first, uh, the first plane on Monday. And then we lost 3-0. So I called my wife and I said, um, honey, uh, we, we have a problem. She's like, what? I said, well, we lost. And next week, Sunday is their last chance. We're still leading, so, uh, but we're playing at home. So I'm going to stay here for a week. And she's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Cost me a week on the couch, but I mean, uh. Uh, I was, I, I, I was able to stay and then obviously we won, but um, no, those were, those three things were actually great sport moments for me. It's always hard to go back in time when you, th- when you, when you talk about uh, sports moments, um, yeah, I mean, when I was young, the whole family, I think Ajax ruling the Champions League in 94, 95, uh, beating AC Milan. Yeah. Yep, AC, AC Milan. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. But then then the following year, losing against Juventus. I mean, I've seen it all. Um, those are great moments. But I think over time, you, you take the, the, you take the most... Uh, the, the closest one, like yeah. 2007, isn't that long ago? Well, yeah. 13 years, but yeah. And I was actually hoping 2010 or even 2014 with the World Cup, but Spain kicked our butts. That's one of those, good old, yeah. Good old, good old, good old Casillas with his big fat toe. My man, the saint. But funny yeah. enough, I supported Netherlands. That's like the one. The one time I was like, yeah, I, I didn't want Spain to win that one. Surprise, I know. And then no, but it was, I think it was meant to be. No, it was Spain meant had to a fan, be. It was they they had a fantastic, fantastic. At sport. the same time, I was happy for Casillas because he, he's my favorite. Mm, yeah. Yep. No, that, that yeah, no. So yeah, fantastic uh, sports moments, but. I think when you when you when you watch something live and it's a huge thing and it and it was so close, especially because the following year he lost to Nadal. 
Mm -hmm. which was a big thing because losing on grass for Federer, especially against Nadal, was a was a big thing. Yeah. And I think that was that was basically the 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 so-called takeover on other services. I mean, obviously Nadal is the king of clay, but he adapted his game to play this game on grass, hard court, you name it, mm -hmm. he did it. Yeah. So it was it was good to see um, one of the big finals on Wimbledon um at Wimbledon and then yeah center court VIP ticket so no a blessed sports moment for me great <laughs> all righty so uh you've already touched on this topic I just um uh, didn't follow up so along with music uh you know you've been around different places countries but we didn't get to tap into your favorite you know where your heart belongs to when it comes to food so just as you have a diverse background you know and you've tasted food from everywhere so where does your heart belong to when it comes to food your favorite no, nothing tastes better than mommy's food Mm. nothing nothing tastes better than your mother's food My i don't dog. care where you are the guy doesn't what wanna, you're doing he doesn't want to betray anybody he doesn't want no I, i i mean um obviously the suriname the suriname kitchen which which is close to the indian kitchen mm -hmm. um no that's that's definitely my soul food and um but at the same time you have you have certain dutch um recipes which, which are basically nothing different than a bunch of potatoes a piece of meat and some vegetables but sounds they, very like, germanish uh, yeah but yeah it's the same thing um you can wake me up for that as well but in general it's it's my mom's suriname food all righty no no he doesn't want to betray doesn't want to get spanked i see what you did there Well, she's watching above these days, but uh, I can tell you if I if I don't say that, she'll she'll probably give me some <laughs> some voodoo voodoo thing. So no, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> was there during your playing days on a tennis side? Was there any play any any player that you played against that any any experience that stood out? You know, any some just one experience that stood out like you know do... to be honest i mean i i can brag now and say i beat this one and that one but no i wasn't really a a, a very good player on international level um i was i was quite injured a lot so well i was i, I was I, looking I think... for more of something funny that happened while playing um well i mean We've seen each other, and when things aren't my aren't going my way, I can I can become uh, very grumpy. So I had <laughs> I, I I made this bet with a friend of mine, and he said, "Well, if you beat this guy six nil six nil, uh, which is basically a double bagel, yeah, um, we're going out for the full weekend, and I'll pay anything, everything." And I was leading six love five love. I had two match points and then it started to rain oh, and no. the match got and the match got suspended and because because it was the final weekend we didn't even want, uh they didn't um uh, finish the matches and normally um they 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 flip a coin if you don't start the match okay but now now it was a, a strange situation because we were one of the first matches uh during that tournament And then I said to the guy, I said, listen, I'm leading six love, five love. I have two match points. What do you think is going to happen? You will never, ever, never, ever win that match again. And then he's like, well, the organization has to follow the rules. And they flipped the coin and I lost. <laughs> <laughs> God, Lee. So I, was, I was so mad. Wow. And, and not 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 even because I lost that match because to me that was just I mean that was just a, a thing on paper. At that time, I didn't really care about tournaments and and winning and losing. It was the fact that I wasn't able to like two minutes before the 
before the, the rain came in, I had this huge, huge chance to win the match. Yeah. Because the, because the match wasn't finished, my friend said, hey, bad luck. You didn't finish the match. You didn't win. <laughs> so the whole weekend, I was basically going out with my friends. And every time when I, when, when I ordered a drink, he's like, you know, it could be a free drink. So yeah, no, that was uh, a very a very funny funny thing when it comes down to tennis and oh, man. tournaments. <laughs> but no, uh, that's it. Uh, kind of sounds almost like me, but it wasn't me. I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> 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 All right, hit us with the final uh, with the yes, yeah, the final question. So uh, leave the audience with something that uh, you you like to give, like um. A, a, final word of advice or just a line from a book you've read or just something you like to leave the audience with for these times that we are in well uh, i mean exactly like you say it with these times we are in live your life to the fullest i mean uh, life's too short to 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 get this crap um bucked at you i mean um you've seen it now with with with, with the shootings with the black life matters um um, even here in Amsterdam, we have weekly shootings these days. It's unbelievable. Um, and, and, and for what? Um, I don't care what kind of age, name, color, um, whatever you are, wherever you come from. I mean, just, just, just love each other. What's the big deal? What, what's so hard about it? Who cares who you are, where you're from? Just help each other and love each other and, and, and live life at the fullest. That's the only thing I can say. That's what we're doing here. We help each other. We love each other. And uh, that's what we do. Well, I hope the right people will listen. And, you know. I hope so. I hope because so. Because you and I, we don't have that problem. No, <laughs> no. Good vibes only. Good vibes only. Yep. Yes, sir. Except, except, except when our clubs are playing each other. Hey, <laughs> even after that, when we, after all the trash talking, we're still back at you know we're still gonna laugh at the end of the day because we know it's not and the end of the world. No, it's just the, it's just the game, right? It's just the game. All righty. So, do you have anything you like to plug in? Uh, if people want to find you, or you know, no. To be honest. Um, um, I'm not doing anything regarding social media whatsoever. I have my Facebook just to to connect with with closest friends and family, All right. which include which includes you. To be honest, huh? Yeah. Um, other than that, to me, social media became too too much. Um, I I think I think I think it's it's more negative these days than positive. And like I said, I'm good vibes only. I don't yeah. like these negative things. So. No, I don't have any Instagram. I don't have any Twitter. I don't have any LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I you have, have something you'd like to promote uh, right now. Uh, your your podcast. Listen, listen and tune in and join in and uh, share the vibes. That's Thank all. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. All righty. So thank you for joining us and um, make sure you catch us for the next episode and leave us five stars on iTunes and Stitcher. And thank you for the privilege of your company. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to White Label American. If you enjoy the show, we'll appreciate if you rate, review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. If you have any questions, comments, or have someone who will be a good guest on the show, or you want to be on the show, send us a message at whitelabelamerican at gmail.com. And make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at White Label American. Thank you for your support. <laughs>